for that. All right, so let's get after it. So I'm Rob Tiffany, and this is almost as many words crammed in there as my HTML5 session yesterday. You know, it's not enough for me to say, hey, I'm going to do a session on building mobile apps. You know, if I had a dollar for every mobile app session I've been to. Um, and, and enterprise mobile apps, a lot of people think, well, it's probably the same thing as consumer apps. And it is, ish, some overlap. But, um, but there's, a, there's a lot of differences, too. Um, and that's the thing we're going to go into. The differences is how much time you spend on the back end, mostly, versus the device. So this is me. I work at Microsoft. I do mobile strategy. I probably do way more stuff on tablets these days than phone, just in my day job. Uh, helping those get out there, help our folks in the field with escalations and stuff like that. Obviously, we're in the middle of a battle royale against the iPad uh, in the tablet space and a whole bunch of Android tablets, and then not to mention the phone thing that's been raging. Everybody see that we, we went across 5.6% in the U.S. for Windows Phone? Yeah, I know. That's pretty exciting, isn't it? <laughs> hey. It's like double where we were last year, just about. So uh, that's all good. That's all good. Um, so I have a quick anecdotal story to tell you. I really, this is not a canned story pretending to be anecdotal. It really happened this way this morning when I was walking here. So I went over and had uh, breakfast over at the Court of Two Sisters, you know, sat out there and did the jazz brunch thing. That was lovely. And then kind of walked down towards the river, and I'm kind of walking down to Cater. And I don't know if anybody's seen the Peaches record store down there. It's, and like oh, most half the place is still all vinyl records, and so it's pretty cool. So I walk in there. I mean, this is just a few hours ago. I walk in there like this, and the guy who owns the store, guy with long hair and everything, he's like, oh, I'm so glad you're here. And I'm just like, what? And, he's, and he sees it says Windows Phone, and he thought I was part of the geek squad or something coming to save them. So, um, so I actually... In addition to looking at some vinyl records, I spent about 20 minutes helping them with their Windows 8 machine. Turns out there was a lot of extra crapware on their machine that they bought, and some different people decided to install it. And it's kind of weird how things work when you have like three different antivirus things running all at the same time and extra firewalls, and they were wondering, why is everything just acting slow and freaky? So uh, yeah. Anyway, so I got a free bottle of water out of that deal. And I showed off my Windows phone. And here's another anecdotal thing. It is what it is. You know what he said? You guys make a phone? <laughs> hey, and he calls to his buddy, check it out. They make a Windows phone. Look, the tiles. It's just like that Windows 8 thing we have. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's where they got the idea from. <laughs> it's like, oh, well, you know, we'll take it. All right, how do I get this countdown timer started? Do I start it here, or do you start it? Oh, there it goes. It's magic, because I know I'll, we'll go for like four hours or something. So what are we going to talk about? I'm going to talk about some mobile enterprise stuff. Some of it you'll already know, because you've been in the mobile game for so long, and some might be, things might be new. I'm going to show you how to build some mobile middleware, which is crazy, uh, using things you already have laying around at your own company already. You don't have to go spend $5 million on some package. I mean, you... so just to give you some background, years ago, I started being the guy when I was working in MED, mobile embedded devices. I would talk to Gartner every year about this magic quadrant thing called multi channel access gateway or MAG. And it was about a class of systems, mobile development, back end systems. The idea was any back end to any device. How can you do that? Reuse code, that kind of thing. And so there was lots of pure play players in there. And so uh, then they changed the name a few years later to Mobile Enterprise Application Platform. And they've got even new names now for development tools in this mobile space. But needless to say, I'm, like, I'm, I'm the person saying, yes, we're awesome, and let me show you. you know. And so anyway, something to look up. There's this whole Gartner magic quadrant thing with critical capabilities, a checkbox, checklist. Can you do this? Can you do this? Can you do this? And we can do all those things. But we don't do it in a single shrink wrap product. We have competitors, small pure play companies that build kind of a shrink wrap MEEP product, like kind of mobile middleware thing and out of the box kind of stuff. Turns out it's not quite as out of the box as you think it is when you actually have to install it in your data center. 
but the brochure looks nice. So all I do is I spend time talking to Gartner and I talk to executives and like I'll talk with you and I'll kind of, this is obviously a lot deeper. Normally I'll do a high level talk and just talking about MEEP and how we align to it and I'll touch on that some, but we are gonna just totally, I hope you're in the right place. We are gonna get medieval in code here. I'm gonna show you how to build it. Cause you know, after so many years of talking high level, executive level about this stuff, I was like, you know what, you gotta make it real. This shit's gotta get real. So we're gonna do that. And so I'm gonna build the whole thing and you're gonna see back end, middle tier, published to internet, consumed from phone, consumed from tablet, orders taken offline, pushed all the way back up, back to a back end system so that it's real for you. And then you'll also find out, hey, I'm an expert at all those products already. That's kind of cool. So anyway, that's what I'm gonna do. This is one differentiator in enterprise mobile development is you're gonna spend a lot more time in the back end. Um, you know, it's not exactly the same as the consumer apps. Building that back end infrastructure is the differentiator, really. Um, you'll find the smallest amount of time you spend will probably be on your mobile app. I might be wrong, you might build a whole lot of ton of logic and everything, and I could be completely wrong. But a lot of people think it's gonna be no big deal to just be building mobile enterprise apps after they've been building two and three screen little fun toy consumer apps for the app store. And so, uh, you know, I, a bat phone rings in my office every few weeks um, over the years and about technology that I thought was in the rear view mirror of my life, but I still get on a plane and come help people with stuff. And it's all mobile related and it's giant scale, lots of devices deployed, data moving all over the place. And, um, you know, sometimes you think about how I keep doing this thing over and over again, and what's, what, what, what's in common every time? And the thing that was in common is, well, I spend almost the whole time working on back-end stuff. I'm there to solve a mobile problem, and yet I spend the least amount of time on the mobile app and fixing things there. Sometimes it's all about that. Like, people just don't know what they're doing, best practices, they don't know about memory management, and things like that. But most of the time, 90% of the time, it's back-end stuff. And the reason is, is because it's an enterprise thing and it's got a scale. And someone downloaded a white paper from MSDN or wherever and showed them, hey, here's how you build this cool thing. And they get it working on their laptop and they're like, we are green lighted to do this thing. And then they build it just like that. And then when they deploy 5,000, 10,000, 80,000 devices, they wonder, well, I wonder why it's getting so slow and doesn't scale and stuff like that. And anyway, that's what this is all about. So. A MEEP, extending your back-end systems, your organization. So whether it's, you know, SAP, your back-end systems you build yourself, stuff in databases, stuff you're grabbing from message buses, whatever. All that valuable data, you're unlocking the value of that back-end stuff and you need to get it out to devices. It's not like we haven't been doing that stuff for over a decade, but we've been doing it very in one-off manners, using all kinds of random tools to do different pieces of that. And so uh, what I wanna, the whole point is ROI and reusable. You wanna be able to use the same tools over and over again for the same stuff so that your project goes faster and you lower risk because you're not doing new training and you know, I'm not using 20 different tools to do all these different things. So I just wanna use one or a handful or whatever. Oh my gosh, how did this slide get into my deck? Anyway, if you've been to any mobile sessions here this week, you've probably seen this before. Believe it or not, Windows Phone is built for business. And um, I think we've even given whole sessions about this. I mean, I think you, the takeaway, and like I talked about a couple days ago, you know, with the NT kernels running everywhere, it's running on ARM, it's running on x86, and it's running on servers and all-in-ones and tablets and phones. Uh, and then you see with Office and you see with line of business apps, the commonality, being able to reuse that code, you know, do the 80-20 rule, right? Uh, we're using code across platforms, so I get Office everywhere and Link and things like that. And then device management and software distribution for all our devices. And your desktops and things you've been doing forever that don't seem as exciting as all the new cool smartphones you have. So the takeaway is we got you covered on all that stuff. So let's move into enterprise concepts. Why are people going mobile? You probably already know this first one, the productivity and efficiency gains you get. Letting people work anytime, anywhere, wherever they want, you know, working at Starbucks, working at home, work, you know, 
unless you work for Marissa Mayer at Yahoo, then maybe this may not apply. I don't know. Did I say that aloud? <laughs> That's so ironic with her. Never mind. Um, anyway, but yes, aside from that, yes, everybody else gets to be working all over the place. So it's cool. And so it's all good. What are we doing? We're untethering ourselves. We're not connected to Ethernet anymore, right? They're, you know, we're everywhere. So this is interesting. Real time versus batch mode, speeding up the cadence. That looks like, you know, McKinsey or somebody came up with that stuff, right? But it's for real, building a real time enterprise. Um, I've blogged about this and I, I came up with a funny term and I've probably said it before. I'm so surprised. I still see people today. I, I double checked my calendar. It's the 21st century. I still see companies. So I spend a lot of time with people doing stuff out in the field, driving trucks, working on pipelines, doing whatever, uh, you know, pickup and delivery, whatever it is, all kinds of stuff like that. I still see people out there with pen and paper today, and they're out there doing their thing, and they're writing down what they're capturing, and they're telling them where to go and what to do, and it's 100% on paper. And you're like, wow, that's really old school. I thought, I thought we got rid of that a long time ago. But then it gets worse than that, you know, because you know what? Some, it is what it is. Some people are still doing paper, you know, we're trying to get them off paper. You know, figure devices and wireless data networks, that's a great start. But then what makes it worse is then when those nice folks finish the day, it's the end of the day, and they're a field person, and they should be able to just take their truck and go straight home. But no, they drive it all the way back to the office, wherever that is, far away from home, at about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and then they sit down and they do something that we used to do Remember we used to, remember how IT and IS, we had all these different names, it used to be called data processing and stuff like that. Do you remember like in the 70s or 80s or whatever, we had tons of people that did data entry into computers? Well, we still have it today as it turns out. Those poor guys are coming back to the office with their piece of paper and they put it on the desk and then they log into whatever backend system, maybe they're pulling up their SAP console or whatever, and they are transcribing that stuff. And that is a normal part of their life. I really thought that was gone. I was so wrong. There are different shades of gray, too. That's one extreme example. There's a lot of stuff really prevalent that's not nearly as bad, but still just as inefficient. And so it's what, that's what batch mode is. You know, I did all this stuff, and then I went back to the ranch and entered it again. Instead of capturing it real time, sending it you know, wirelessly back to office, and things happen. Making better decisions at the point of activity, the user with a wireless device, your employee, is out there, either information they need right when they're about to shake hands and meet a customer, critical information they need to have to talk about them, or maybe, kind of like the poor guy with the pencil and paper, what's a good, simple example, like proof of delivery, you know? Yes, this transaction just happened, I got a signature for it, and I, turn that signature into a byte array and I send it over wireless over web services or some kind of sync thing back to the office. And then we start doing the invoicing process and the process starts right then. It doesn't start when I go back to the office and transcribe or, thing, or things fall through the cracks. So that real time enterprise, the things happen where it happens, not later. CIOs, I know you always hear Forrester, Gartner, top priorities for CIOs and stuff like that. I know we did a good session uh, the other day, too, uh, at a higher level about, about how it's probably more important just for IT to align with the business. Within the techie stuff, one of the things, you know, I think mobile's number two this year. You know, BI, big data, I think, is number one this year. Um, but they kind of go hand in hand a little bit. So extending back-end systems out to those mobile users. There's a whole lot of back-end systems that we just were not designed to go out to mobile devices. There's some that are, and that's great that a lot of them are, are not, or they're just databases, or they're just whatever. And they, you know, they want to get it out to empower their employees. And so that's a big priority. And then I keep talking about going out, but there's the coming back in. I'm in the field, I'm wherever, and I'm capturing data, and I come back in, and I do it for analytics. That data coming in sometimes is useful to put into uh, analytics. Does anybody know where big data comes from? It comes from lots of little data. <laughs> That's it, you know? The internet of things, our device is a thing, a sensor is a thing, something on a pipeline is a thing, whatever. Lots of little data streams in and becomes big data, and then we use it for analytics. Well, it might be useful to know that this tech stuff I'm gonna talk to you about is gonna help you, help you with that. 
So how do you do it? Well, you get this mobile middleware thing. You know, you know, I kind of said I don't need any backend to any device, right? So I need to be able to integrate all these backend data sources. Who knows what you have at your company or your customer has uh, that you've got to connect to. And then you don't want to just have like 30 different types of connections to 30 different backend systems. You want to hide it all and create a unified, simple interface to the whole thing so that you reduce complication out there pointing out the field. Uh, and that's kind of that whole server facade type thing, right? And you're exposing that composite data. So I'm pulling data from all these different places into SQL Server and, kind of, and then I'm exposing it. You've used the term composite data in the last decade when we were started doing web services and things like that. Um, and then you've got to make sure those services are consumable by any device. I'd like for them to be consumed by Windows Phone or, or tablet, but you know, I know they're going to be consumed elsewhere too. The multi-channel access gateway. That's just kind of the thing that publishes. The word multi-channel means it works with anything. I didn't create a, binary, uh, a proprietary wire protocol that only works between this server and this device. I have something that works with everybody. Uh, that kind of thing. Kind of like Exchange Active Sync, EIS. It works with everybody. Everybody can get email and do lightweight device management. And it's, you know, it doesn't discriminate. And it safely publishes it out from your data center. And then you have development tools to, and again, I want to use the same development tool to write the code for my app. Oh, and also write the code that moves the data and writes the server code and writes the integration of the backend system code and have that same tool be able to do, to talk to any backend system the same way over and over again and everything. I don't want to have to get 30 tools to figure out all this. And I don't want to have to write special code each time I talk to another backend system. There's no efficiency to be gained there. And then, of course, you've got your devices that are running native apps or browsers, and they need to be able to consume that data, take it offline, perform transactions offline. We can't count on the wireless always being there ubiquitously. Did I make that word up? And, um, and then be able to send it back when the network's there. And when I say apps and web browsers, you know, I'm always alluding to one thing. So I did my HTML5 session yesterday, and I talked about just REST and JSON and AJAX and doing IndexedDB and things like that. One of the key takeaways is, you know, and this is just a personal thing with me, if I could build something on the back end that exposes all that valuable data to devices, and I can do it in a way that does not require an SDK to work with that data, then I have succeeded. Because there's all kinds of data formats and all kinds of ways to get stuff, and they require you to have some kind of SDK to work with in order to interpret what that data is. But if it's just plain old REST and JSON, if your browser can work with it with just what's out of the box, out of the box, um, you know, in JavaScript, JavaScript and Ajax can call that service and it can deserialize JSON and work with it, and it didn't need an SDK. If you can make it work with the browser, you can make it work anywhere. So I think that's kind of a good smoke test, little test, you know, you know, hey, if I can make it work there, I'm good. So here's a visualization of all the words I just threw out. So if you kind of look at this from top to bottom here, building your MEEP, you've got, you know, out on the far sides there in the top right and left, you've got back-end systems, and you're going to connect to those with different EAI adapters. And again, this is not me making any of this up. This 100% aligns with the Gartner critical capabilities. Whenever I think, walk through these, I'm just 100% aligning with their stuff. So I'm going to connect to back-end databases, data sources, message queues, whatever, proprietary packages, different packages, web services, whatever. I need to be able to integrate with all those guys in a simple, easy way over and over again. Gartner has the rule of three for everything that has to do with ROI. I need to be able to talk to at least three different types of back-end systems and run at least three different mobile apps and talk to three different OSs and that kind of thing so that you're truly getting value. Your people are trained once, and then they use the same stuff over and over again. And so they're right there in the middle, that mobile middleware globbed together. You know, so it's the EAI, that integration of the backend stuff. It's aggregating the data together. And in this case, we're going to use SQL Server. Think of those as staging tables. Sometimes you build the whole solution from scratch, and it begins and ends with SQL Server in your device. But sometimes SQL is in the middle. And you might be thinking, why am I talking about SQL? Isn't that like what we use BizTalk for or something else? You know, absolutely, you could. The reason I picked SQL is because SSIS is pretty darn capable, like BizTalk, and plugging into things. And the SQL Server also has this ability to cache and be kind of a middle gateway kind of tier, you know, caching, staging table area. 
So anyway, that's what it does. And then you expose it as web services. You publish it securely out to the internet. And then any device should be able to consume that data, do transactions offline. And then you get maximum value for your company or your customers. You're not creating a proprietary thing each time you build a new solution. You get to use this over and over and over again. And your customers love you. So, and they'll love you more if you say, hey, you know what? I bet you you have all this stuff laying around in your enterprise already. And I'm going to show you how to put these Lego blocks together to build this crazy thing. So let's talk about mobile middleware. So I said, I showed you the picture, EAI to back in systems and data sources, aggregating and caching that composite data. Maybe I'm pulling back customers from a CRM system and products from an ERP system, that kind of thing. And so caching them in a staging table. I don't necessarily mean caching them like in-memory caching, like you're thinking, but we're going to do that too. Um, and then you create business entities, you know, uh, business objects that model, that look like those tables that are going to go out and on the device, because the device is going to work with the same data offline, like offline databases or things like that. And so you have business entities that are going to model what that looks like. And then you're going to build RESTful web services to expose those business entities to mobile clients. And so, you know, one thing I know for sure, REST and JSON seems to work with the browser and every device on the planet. So I'm going with it. And it's also wireless friendly because it's lighter weight. It's you know, infinitely lighter weight than SOAP and XML, for instance, right? You know, we spent the last decade, the whole SOA revolution, and we all built web services in front of all of our back end stuff. OK, a whole people, bunch of people, it turns out they didn't do that, actually. I thought they did. Then anyway. but. Those this weren't necessarily wireless friendly. They were thinking about the plugged in Ethernet connected, you know, on the network LAN thing. And they weren't thinking about the wireless revolution of mobile devices. And we need to be we need to, you know, have empathy for the user at all times, right? And so we need to make sure we give them the best experience. So let's drill into the back end system stuff. And I chose SSIS. So if you were you or your customer is doing a package evaluation for possible meet packages, because there's a bunch of pure players out there. There's a really giant player out there. One of the things you or they are going to look at, and this is a huge selling point on these meet packages, is how many different things can I connect to? I mean, that's, that's really that's one of the most important parts of the whole thing. And so I'm going to show you what SSIS can connect to. And so you can see things like SAP and Salesforce and Dynamics. And then look at all those databases. And you know what? It has native stuff to talk to those databases natively, exactly. But we also know that if it didn't, who cares? I've got ODBC and OLADB and things like that. I can connect to any database, so that's not a problem. Messaging, message queues, message buses, web methods, grabbing things off of a TIBCO bus, things like that, EDI. It's right out of the box. You know? And then the internet. Those back-end SSIS things, they could call web services for you to do the same thing. If I got stuff in salesforce.com I need to pull in, I can do it. It's real easy. If you compare this and go out and do your own homework, because you should, and look at a lot of the major players, all you know, um, you'll find that none of the other players even come remotely close to being able to connect to as many things. And remember, connect the same way. I didn't write, I'm not writing, you know, a hundred different ways of doing code to talk to all these. I'm doing it the same way over and over again. So what do I, how do I do that? Adapters. So everybody in the Meet space will talk about their adapters to connect to back-end things. So SSIS, that's our adapters. So we have a thing called SQL Server Data Tools. It's part of Visual Studio. So the theme I had here is I want you to use one tool for everything. We have one tool that does all this stuff. It's called Visual Studio. Visual Studio has these SQL Server data tools in there that let you visually create SSIS packages. You probably had no idea you were coming to a, a session where I was going to do ETL, but yes. And so and I'm just going to do it minimally just to get it, illustrate the point. And so I'll show a simple one called connecting to OLADB data source, but it works with everything. It's a visual drag and drop. Here's the source. Here's the destination. Train once to connect to everything, right? That's the important thing. And then. Encryption at every tier is so critical. I mean, security is in the news every day now. It is so super, super critical. People want to take your IP. They want to take your financials. They want to take everything. And they are betting that your mobile devices are going to be the weak link. Don't let them. So you need encryption at every single tier, not just on the device. So we can encrypt things going from your, all these package integrations, things that you probably weren't even thinking that you would want to encrypt. 
It's like, oh, it's safe. It's already in my data center, and it's way back there in the back part of it, too. Well, you know, don't leave anything to chance. It's up to you. You can leave it to chance if you want, but I want to let you know that we can let you lock it down. And then when it comes to this whole adapter thing, speed is important. Nobody talks about the performance. People, different meat vendors will say, yeah, we can connect to these 10 things or these five things. But speed's important too. And it just so happens that nothing is faster at ETL operations than SSIS. So here is a visualization in your private cloud or your hybrid cloud of what this would look like. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to slowly build these over the, throughout the course of this session. I'm going to build this cloud. And I'm going to go from top to bottom. And as I go down, I'll drop off the one above it. So the big takeaway here, so SQL Server, but you know, you kind of got the gear SSIS thing, and you just kind of see it using EAI to talk to all these back-end things. So that's the big takeaway, is I can bidirectionally send and receive data back and forth and aggregate it into SQL Server. But you know, it's not real unless we have a demo. So let's do it. All right, we're going to get crazy here. So I'm in Visual Studio. This is the uh, SQL Server data tools. And we're just going to go through this really fast just to illustrate the point. So here I've got these data flow tasks, one for products. Actually, let me back up even further. So I don't really have an ERP system or anything like that running on my machine. So I have, I have three access databases pretending to be, because it's the only, I have so many different instances of everything running at the same time, it would be difficult. So here, what I'm going to do is uh, my pretending to be my back-end system is my ERP system um, with the different products here. You can see different types of fruit hanging out here. Uh, and then you know the CRM thing is not wanting to show on the screen. And then I have the orders. And the orders is going to be empty now, but you're going to create the order offline on the device and send it back in, because that's what you do. So now the next thing is, is I've got my, my tasks here. But before I show you that, I still have to prove to you that there's nothing up my sleeve. So let's look at the, I'm going to, so I took those three, those three back-end systems. I'm going to aggregate them into a customer table, orders, and products. And it's important that you see that there's you know, absolutely nothing in these tables. And you don't really need to see the design view. <laughs> so no orders, no products, no nothing. All right, so let's just quickly run this. You know, so products data flow task, this is what it looks like. And you visually drag and drop this. You know, I point to my data source. In this case, it's the products table in an access database. And then it's pointing here to my mobile middleware, AKA SQL Server. And it points to a product tail. In this case, I don't need to do a transformation. But you know what? You may have to do transformations, and you'll be happy to have a full-blown ETL tool that can do that, as opposed to things that can only just do straight data to data and not make transformations, because sometimes you need formats to be different, right? And so all I'm going to do, so I have that for products, customers, and orders. So let's just run it real quick. We'll hit run. And you can look down at the super tiny text here at the bottom that you can't read. Anyway, that shows that it moved all these rows and orders it moved zero rows and blah, blah, blah. And then let's stop it and let's go to SQL Server, our middleware, and verify that, in fact, that worked. So products, we execute. Yep, there's our mangoes and peaches and everything. Orders, there should be nothing there. And in fact, there's not and then products, or uh, customers, rather. And there's our customers. But you probably also see some strange extra GUIDs out there, and I'll explain that in a second. So that's good. So the back end, any back end to our middleware has succeeded. So we're marching down the field. It's all good. All right, this is not part of Meet, but this is part of Rob. Scaling out. So I don't know, like you, maybe other people are architects and folks in the audience. I'm a student of scalability. And I got pushed into it. I love it, but I got pushed into it because my customers couldn't figure out how to scale. And so I've spent you know, probably the better part of the last decade helping people figure out how to scale to ridiculous levels. So, and I did a lot of stuff with replication over the years because we had this easy to use SQL C that could replicate with SQL Server. And it made it really easy for people to build mobile solutions in, on Windows Mobile, for instance, or on, and on our tablets. And you can do it today. Uh, you could even do it with something like this. Anyway. But there's another usage of replication. If you 
do like I do. If you go and watch YouTube videos of architects from Facebook or eBay and Google and stuff, and you can learn, because everybody wants to share information, which is great. And they have videos. Let me show you how we scaled out Facebook. Wouldn't it be great if you knew how to do that? I mean, you may never have to build anything that takes care of a billion people, but if you knew the concepts behind it, and then you found out, because this guy Rob told me that, oh my gosh, all that stuff's built into my Microsoft stuff, I could do the same thing? That's crazy talk. But we have it. You know, obviously we're not going to have a billion people hitting one database, right? Now, a lot of people use NoSQL databases, and some people are using you know, Oracle, us, they use MySQL, stuff like that. So what did Facebook do? They used the built-in replication in MySQL to replicate out shards of data, different tables, different parts of tables, out to different nodes. Because we can't have everybody hit. Even the best database on the planet, whoever makes it, can only take so much, right? Certainly can't handle a billion. So, but I could do a shared nothing architecture where I horizontally partition the data out and I can make it happen that way, right? Because remember, scaling out's not just about load balanced web servers. That will only take you so far. It's part of the equation, no doubt about it, but scaling out the data is also part about it. Well, guess what? We have replication. It's built in the SQL engine. We've had it since the mid-90s. You can absolutely use this technology to do this shared nothing scale out technology. And when you know you can do it, it doesn't mean you have to implement it now, but you can design your database to be broken apart. You really need to think about how can I just break this thing apart and not have it always need tight referential integrity or things like that because I might need to scale to, I might need, what if I have to, because you know, you think about mobile. Mobile has pushed the envelope of what people expect, you know. I, I, you know, it used to be I'm building a solution for 1,000 users or 10,000 users. What if I have to build something for the general public? What if I'm building a B2C enterprise app that's collecting data from customers through a, an app that's in an app store and that data is fed back in? And I, whoops, I accidentally had 10 million people use my solution. I might they need to be ready to do this really fast or my whole system might just fall on its face. So replication allows you to, through an easy to use wizard, scale out your tables, your columns, and shard them out onto different nodes, different servers, and do them smaller, you know, so you don't have the giant mother of all systems out there, you know, so you get faster disk I.O., you know, because the, the, the amount of stuff used in memory to disk is better than nodes. Most of them, remember, I, I love to talk about the 80-20 rule. Sometimes it's 90-10. Most people are selecting. When you go do a Bing or a Google search, you're selecting, you're getting things. Most people get, a few people can push. They do inserts, updates, and deletes. So what most of your scale out solution will be is read only, just download only tables. So my customer table from my big database is gonna to go to the customer server. And then my orders is gonna to go to this server and this one. And then if I need to break it out further, I can break it out within the different rows within those things. But most of them are going to be read-only, which makes this really easy. And then a smaller group will be for stuff coming up that's new. Oh, and I can use it for geo-replication for giving me that fault tolerance across, you know, data centers. Because it's great if I showed you how to build this crazy scale-out thing in one data center, but what happens if the data center goes down? So you need to be able to... Build it, and you know, I promise you, I would not tell you this stuff if I have not built all this stuff myself with real customers and connected multiple data centers using our transactional replication. People often don't think to use that. They are thinking of other, you know, other technologies, other clustering, other ways to, to do, you know, failover DR stuff. This actually gives you active-active because the peer-to-peer the -peer will try to keep, and so now you can imagine two data centers and peer-to-peer is keeping these guys connected and then they all have their hierarchy in each data center scaling out. And so you can actually have people hitting multiple data centers. And they're going to look like each other. And so it looks something like this. This is the picture. So SQL Server, no one's going to hit it directly. They're going to publish replication out to, they, they do publishers and subscribers, pub, sub, like you might imagine. So you have all these SQL Server subscribers that will pull down the data. And then geo-replication using peer-to-peer -peer technology that's built into the engine to do remote data centers. And you can do this with your private cloud and hybrid stuff as well. I mean, I'm totally pumped that we now have infrastructure services, IaaS, right, in Azure. So you can do that there. So let's do a demo. Let's make it real. 
you're probably thinking, there's no way you can show me this. All right, I'm not gonna walk through the wizard, but if you look down here on the lower left side, you'll see I have these publications. I'll just, we'll just look at one of them here. Let's look at the properties of this publication. Basically, I created a publication. I'm publishing the customer table, and I chose, I did a checkbox and said, yes, I want everything in this customer table to go out there. I checked this checkbox right here, that, that um, right here, I'm sorry, the highlighted table is download only. So a whole bunch of metadata and a whole lot of extra work doesn't happen because it's just download only. I could choose to filter it. I'm not doing it. I'm going to pull the straight customer table down. But if your sharding requirements require you to do customers A through F on this server, and you know, you, you've heard the story, on multiple servers, you can absolutely do that. The filtering, the stuff that we've had in here forever, because replication was initially built to have branch offices sync with each other and, and make changes and merge the changes back together after being disconnected. This is just perfect for doing your scale out sharding. So anyway, that's the takeaway, and then we have subscribers you can see I've got customer subscribers. And so, you know, I have this all in the same SQL server, um, but these, would, these different subscribers would definitely be on different nodes. And so they're pulling the data down. So what I did is I created these other nodes. So there's an order node, a product node. And so if I look in the products, you'll see that the products have come out here, even though they initially went into the, the higher level table, right? Now, do you know what the GUID is for, right? It's for change tracking and things like that. It's to keep those rows unique, because you need some uniqueness when you're doing replication of any kind, whatever sync technology you're using. Um, so that's how it does it. So what you'll see here, obviously, the orders table, the orders node will be empty, but it's going to get filled up. And uh, what's interesting, you, you do a little trick. If I show you the publication for the orders, with a, I do have a filter for orders, and it's a very simple filter. It might be hard to see. The filter just says where one equals zero. Let me edit, show an edit view. Because we have this easy to use tool to let you filter this. This is just SQL, right? And basically it says, where one, if I put in where one equals zero, that value obviously can never be true, right? So what that has the effect of is it pulls down the shell of the table and the columns and indexes and whatever and then the one equals zero says, oh, but I can't have data. So it doesn't download any data. And it does exactly what you want it to do. Because an order is something new I capture on the device and I upload and I want it off my device. But when it goes to the order shard, I don't want it to hang around there forever. As soon as it gets there, the replication engine will pull it off there and take it back up to the top. And then you could geo-replicate that to your other data center. So that's the quick takeaway there. And so, you know, again, you know, showing you that those those, as I just did here, that those shards actually indeed got their data. And so this, the scaling out, it's really that simple. And I blogged about it. Uh, go to robtiffany.com. I, I walk through step by step actually how to do all that stuff, all the, all the wizards and all the things you need to follow through. So what's the next thing? So we've done our shared nothing architecture. Now we've got to get the data out to devices. So web services. Multi-channel transport. Transport's got to work with anything. Can't be a, a proprietary wire protocol. And same with the data format. So REST, everybody works with REST these days. And JSON has supplanted XML as the kind of universal way of serializing data. You should also turn on compression on your, on your server. Then you build those business objects that model what that table looks like. You know, that customer table. It's customer ID, customer name. How easy is that? I'll show you. And so you, because you're going you're gonna to retrieve the data and hydrate and fill a business object, like a customer object, and then you're going to serialize that, turn that into JSON to go over the internet, because the internet is just this giant pipe of strings. And then performance scalability. So we're already doing crazy stuff to get performance and scalability on the back end side with the horizontal partitioning, but you can do more. You're going to scale out your IIS servers. You're going to load balance it. You can, whether you're using our built-in load balancing technology in, in Windows Server or use F5 or one of the other products out there, you scale that out. You should also cache. The best query you can ever make is the one you don't have to make, right? If I don't have to touch the database, things get even faster. So we make it easy for you 
and I go back to my Facebook analogy, they're doing the same thing. What are they using with their Apache servers scaled out? They're using memcache. They're using an open source distributed cache. So that if, if you know, and what's the architectural principle we're going to follow here, right? First time in, I'm going to check the cache. If the data's there, I'm going to get it right out of RAM, and it's going to take nanoseconds. If it's not there, go hit the database. Don't hit the main database, hit the shard. Get the answer back. Put the answer in the cache while giving it back to the user so that the next user in line gets it from the cache. And caching, while you think about it as all about speed, it's also about scalability. Because scalability is how many people are waiting in line to hit a server to get something. And if you have fewer people waiting in line because it's in cache, then you can scale and support more people on the, hitting those database tables than you would otherwise. So distributing caching, we have app fabric caching. That works on Windows Server, and it runs in Azure. And it's it, it, very simple. It's just like you know putting objects and getting, and we have a way to expire the cache, because you know you can't have them there indefinitely, because that data could get stale, right? Uh, and then we also have, in .NET, we have something called memory cache that you can use that's generic. We used to have some stuff that was more tightly coupled to ASP.NET, and now we have this memory cache. You can actually use it in your apps and anywhere. And so you can use it on your web services on a server-by-server -server level. And of course, we've got to encrypt all this stuff. So we're going to use TLS and basic auth to wrap that in, because we're going over the internet, and we need to make sure we can accommodate everyone. So I'm not necessarily going to use NTLM or some Microsoft kind of thing, right? I'm going to use something that every device can work with. And so you're always kind of thinking, and then when I say lowest common denominator, I don't mean it in a bad way. I, but everybody can do basic auth. Everybody can do SSL. That, IIS server you're hitting, the virtual directory, it can be mapped to your AD. And so those people can pass in their domain, username, and password credentials, it, and it authenticates them and then lets them hit those back end services just fine. And so now here's what our picture has grown to. We've got all these load balanced IIS servers. They are downloading only on the left hand side from these SQL server nodes. And over on the right, we've got one on the far that's doing the uploading. And then in between, you're using some form of caching because you want to increase your performance. Because some crazy guy said that I can build the Facebook thing using Windows servers. And you can. All right. So let's, let's show these RESTful web services. I spent a bunch of years doing lots of Azure Windows Phone 7 demos. And I always use WCF. It was great. And I can do WCF. We had a REST toolkit, and then REST got a lot easier. And then just recently, last year, we came out with uh, ASP.NET MVC4. We came out with something called the Web API uh, that used some of the MVC principles to do something that we discovered was the most popular use case sometimes with WCF. It was like people just wanted to do plain old REST and JSON services. It's like, OK, well, WCF you know, does everything. Maybe we can find an easier, quicker, lighter weight way to do the, ones, the use case that people are actually using the most on the internet. And so I switched. And so I'm using the Web API. And it's super simple. I love it. S simple as your friend, right? So let's pull up our Web API project. And basically, the Web API, you know, so here's, we'll look at the Web config first. Look at the very top. You see, I have multiple data sources. You know, connection strings, to, instead of just one connection string to one database, you see I'm connecting to multiple shards. So, and that's kind of what you would do in production. You will also see, I talked about how you have to model the schema. Luckily, it's nothing too hard. This is the same kind of thing you have to do, like on SAP's product, Unwired Platform and others. You'll have to build mobile business objects or whatever to model what the data looks like. Um, but you, you get the idea. It's basically just a model of the table. And then you have uh, these controllers. Uh, in fact, I'll just for fun, I won't totally build it, but show you how easy it is. I'm going to click here over on this right-hand side on controllers and right-click. Because this is basically how you would create a new REST service. You add controller. And then it, you put the name of the controller. You say, hey, maybe I want to use the entity framework. I'm not using that here. Or you create an empty controller with read-write. And it basically creates a rapid scaffolding for you that looks something like this. This is the guts of what we're going to walk through. But if I go further down here, you'll see it creates get requests, post, puts, deletes. It's using all the verbs of HTTP. 
that works everywhere on the internet, and it turns out that's the best way to do things. So I'm going to illustrate all this for you, though, by hitting F10 lots of times, and sometimes I will hit F11. Is that okay? We're going to debug code, because there's no better way to learn than stepping through code, right? Maybe not? All right. Well, that's what I'm going to do. Bear with me, or hopefully you'll love this stuff, right? That's the best way to illustrate what's going on. So I'm just going to, the great thing is, before I even, you could build out your whole backend system, and you don't have to have built your client yet. You can build all this out and test it in IE, which is great. Before, And then you can see what things are going to look like in advance. So here I, ru I hit run. And there's my web page, and then I just do API, and then let's say I want to look at products. And so it's really just the, the open URI, I hit enter, and boom, I hit the debugger inside Visual Studio. And so you can see I, I, I've called into, I've got my connection string for product shard, and I'm calling a get request that basically I want to get all products. And so I'm going to return a product model. But, I'm gonna, it, but this stuff just automatically serializes at JSON for me. And so as I go here, this is a very recognizable you know, SQL server connection string, creating a command, the most simple select statement on the planet. And then I'm just going to execute the reader. I'm going to verify that there's rows in there. Whew, there is. And then once that's good, then only then will I create a, a product object. And then I'm going to create a list, a generic list to hold those. So, you know. When we think of object to database, you know, the, you know, this product object is a row in your table, right? And the list is the table. And so then we're going to iterate through this. So I'm going to create, I'm going to create a new product, a new product row, and then I'm going to do my fun ADO.NET stuff and convert it. And then just to verify that it's real, we have to do tooltips in the demo too, right? Because you know, and look, there it is. There's Mango, and it's product ID number one. I'll just go through a couple here. And you can see that the product list is also building. And so these are all our products being built and filled in there. And then let's just run it, because you get the idea. Pretty simple stuff. And so at the bottom here, we get our result in JSON. It's probably hard to see here, but that says 317 bytes. And uh, let me up the font on here. But that's, that's, that's the JSON return value of what we're getting. And so all the product IDs and everything. So it comes back in that way. That's the lightest weight, short of doing a proprietary binary serialization that would tie you to a particular platform. This is the lightest way, way to do it there is. Um, I used to do demos years ago where I showed like four or five different ways to pull back the same data. And I did the SOAP and XML. Remember data sets? I uh, did data sets, I've done OData, and OData's gotten slimmer lately, and Andy Wigley's going to talk about that tomorrow, but the OData used to be just giant. And I would show how the same amount of data could, in some cases, you know, <laughs> be, you know, getting close to a meg, and then I would whittle it down to the rest in JSON, and now it's just a few hundred bytes, you know, and people are like, wow, that's magic, you know, I didn't realize. It's important, it's part of UX, it's part of the user experience. If I send it to you in a lightweight format, it's going to get to you faster, and you'll be happier. You push the button, the data comes back faster because you did it this way instead of the big, giant, bloated way, right? So that's all good. And so that's, that's the quick demo of how you do the REST JSON services so, and how you can test it. And so you can build them out, fully test them. You can use IE. You can use Fiddler and, and totally ensure that you're getting what you expect to get. All right, this part doesn't have a demo, but it's just going to talk quickly about how do you get that stuff out of your data center out to the internet. A lot of people ask that question, you know, especially when we're doing so much cloud stuff lately. Cloud, it just kind of works, and you don't, you know. But data center, it's like, how do I get it out? Do I need a VPN? Do I, what do I do? So we, you know, and if you've been to some of my sessions before, you know, I, it's just the same way you're doing Exchange today. You have Exchange Server. Most of you just run Exchange Server. And the things that you did to get Exchange Server data out to the internet so that you could go to the web version of Outlook or get email on your Windows phone, your iPhone, your Android tablet, your Windows tablet, you did the same steps that I'm going to walk you through right here. You all probably used ISA Server or TMG or UAG or Blue Coat or some other reverse proxy technology to do that, to securely publish that data out. 
So that someone doesn't have to set up a VPN connection in advance or do all that kind of stuff. And so it's publish a virtual directory from IIS out to the internet. Well, you're going to do this for your enterprise apps. It's the same exact thing. So there's no new security threat and no new way to learn how to do something. Your IT folks already know how to do this because they're doing it today with Exchange. So something like UAG sits there in your DMZ between the front and back firewalls. And I apologize. I know people get really religious about their DMZ. And, and so if I say it differently than how you have your setup, I'll apologize in advance. But, um, but basically, it's just listening for web requests outside. You know, you, you, you've got to update your DNS server for a real name that people understand that their devices are going to point to. Uh, and then that's just going to map back to a virtual directory on an IS server. You can choose to terminate at UAG or ISA or whatever your SSL traffic and then pass it through unencrypted. Or you can do bridging and pass it through as SSL all the way back to the destination virtual directory. Either way. You can do the constrained delegation fun stuff and pre-authenticate out there. Or, or you can wait till you get to the server to do it. Uh, and the cool thing is, it's not just a reverse proxy. We can do packet inspection. Even encrypted package, we, packets we can crack open. And so that deep packet inspection, we are all about security and making sure that bad stuff's not coming in or someone's not pretending to be calling, uh, sending a bad web service data. You can, we can look at it. And as I said, you don't need a VPN. You're just publishing web services. And it's just like you're doing today with Exchange. And so here's where we are now. IIS server, it's kind of a strange circular view of what your DMZ would look like. But anyway going through the back firewall and UAG in the middle, and then your front firewall being published out. So now let's get to the mobile part. Wow, I'm actually going to have a device in this. So mobile data, the, the last part. You've got to consume that, those, those web services. You've got to deserialize the JSON that's coming at you from over the interwebs into an in-memory object collection. You might work with it in memory. There we have link where you can query a collection of objects using SQLite stuff. Or you can put it in a database. You can serialize it. You can put it in SQLite, SQL CE, something like that. Andy Wigley is going to talk about SQLite. We've been doing some, you may have read on the blogs, we've done some new wrappers for SQLite, like a brand new one we just did last week that runs on Windows Phone and big Windows 8. You could use that if you have bigger, bigger amounts of data. I'm going to show you a way to do it where you don't have to use a database, but it's not for the biggest amount of data either. And so that data is offline. If you were in my HTML5 session, you know, if I did this via an AJAX call in the browser, I would grab that and put it in web storage or put it in IndexedDB. And if I'm a native, I'll do SQL CE, SQLite, or as I'm going to show you in my demo, object serialization. And I'm going to show you the new way to do that using the WinRT APIs, both on the phone and on the tablet here. And then you, you're offline, because offline is the critical component of mobility and doing mobile business. You've got to be offline. And so you're going to capture that data, make changes, do all kinds of stuff. You're always looking down. You're, you're not ever building something where all my changes are always having to go to the cloud or to my data center. Everything happens here. We batch it up. And then later on, we'll sync and get it up there when the network's working. And then, of course, we have to keep security at every tier, right? So you know, we're, 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 we're using SSL. We're doing basic auth. And now we've got to encrypt our data at rest, too. And I, talked about on Monday about having your own apps prompt for AD credentials. And using those credentials that you're going to use to call those web services, you'll pass the credential object to be authenticated on the server. But there's more. You can also use those credentials to create your own encryption key in, using our crypto APIs that are super, super simple, the AES managed stuff. And I think we have some new stuff now with WinRT to encrypt your data at rest. Even if your device is already fully encrypted, and you're feeling all comfortable. If you're super paranoid about that worst case scenario where you're encrypted, password protected, bit lockered, awesome device, you lose it while you're logged in, then all, kind of all bets are off, right? They're already in there. And so, but your, your app can be the last line of defense. If your app's data is encrypted with a totally different encryption key than the rest of the deal, you're still safe. And your app is requiring you know, credentials to get in, you're still safe. And so here's what the cloud looks like now. We have devices pulling back you know, uh, offline data into mobile databases you know, and making those calls. 
but let's do the fun stuff. This is, this is the really fun, crazy stuff. All right. So I keep, I, I keep IE running, because that kind of keeps that engine running for web, the web API in the middle. And then I'm going to, um, I've got not one, but two emulators here. And as you might know, if you do Windows Phone development in Windows Phone 8, the emulator is different than the Windows tablet one, because it's running in Hyper-V. The Windows Phone one is running in Hyper-V. And so it's actually in another machine altogether. And so I can't use localhost to point to IIS. I actually have to know the name or an IP address. And as you might imagine, when I came in here, my IP address changed every time I'm doing demos. So luckily, I can copy and paste from IP config in DOS, right? So let's, uh, I'll do part of this with the phone and part of it with the tablet. So here's one of the cool things I talked about. We talked about in that cool Windows, is, Windows phone for business kind of thing is code reuse is such a big, important thing. Being able, because you're getting to market faster, you're lowering risk, you're not doing, and that's part of the MEEP thing, too, and that's what Gartner's getting at here, is I don't want you having to do a 1,000 different things. I want you to do the same thing over and over again. So I'm going to illustrate, I don't know if anybody knows, something called the HTTP client. So this is a new WinRT API, yet another but easier way to make calls to web services and things like that. And so uh, I'm going to use the HTTP client. But the great thing is, is we also created a portable class library version of that. And the release candidate is out for download. And so I use that so that I could also use it on the Windows Phone 8. And so what I'm going to show you is I'm using identical code on Phone 8 and the tablet to do these operations. Now, when you look at the, what I'm doing, you'll say, well, that's all, I'm, it's, I didn't build out a big app doing a whole bunch of stuff. I'm here to teach you about plumbing. And so all I'm going to show you on both sides is the code to download that JSON data, code to serialize those collections of objects as JSON in your local storage, how to deserialize it and so you can work with it, and then how to create an order and upload it. So I'm going to show all the basic CRUD type stuff and download, upload that you need that every app will use over and over again. Because anything else would just be the particulars of your app, right? So I'm not going to waste your time with that. So. We're going to, I'm going to, as usual, walk through code to do this. So let's fire up our emulator. So download products, download customers, upload orders. That's what we're going to do. So I'll just hit the button here. And again, this is, this is going to be identical code across platforms. So I've got the HTTP client. And it's really this easy. So this HTTP base here, you can see I popped in the IP address for this session that I got from this Wi-Fi router. And then I'm calling, remember when we were in IE, that API slash products. So it's really that simple. And I call it, and then boom, I just switched to my other instance of Visual Studio. So now I'm on my server Visual Studio. And so you can see me doing that stuff. But you've seen this before. So I'm not going to waste your time iterating through that. So let's just say continue. And now, boom, we got the data back. So we're back in Visual Studio on the phone. We have an HTTP client, this new thing called response is success code. So I don't waste a lot of times if, if things blew up, if I couldn't find the server or something like that. And so since it worked out, and then again, you're going to just use the same bullet, bullet code here uh, to deserialize data. So I use the data contract JSON serial, serializer, and I kind of pass in the type of, and remember our model where we've got a, a product object, and we have customer object are the only ones, and we're going to have a generic list of them. So we get that in there. And then literally, as soon as I hit this next F10, let's prove that we received what you saw before. And sure enough, there's our mango and grapes and stuff like that. So wow, this stuff really works. But now I need to show you how to take things offline. So right in line here, I'm going to go ahead and walk through two methods I've created. And you're going to get all this code, and I'm going to blog about it. One's called save collection, and one's called load collection. Or you could call it save table and load table, because you know what? It's sometimes it's easier to just think of these as database tables, because that's what they're behaving like. So let's F11 into those. And so I'm just going to pass in this collection and the name of the file. So I want to save it as, so remember back when we used to do databases like DBase and Paradox and all the ones where you had a file for each table? It's just going to be like that. It's just like that. So collection is not equal to null. And so this is the new asynchronous way of doing some of this file I.O. stuff that's in WinRT. So this is different than what we did in Silverlight on Windows Phone 7 and 7.5.
So you'll see clever use of await and async. But anyway, the, the quick takeaway is I've saved that. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to deserialize that and pull it out of there. And, to, we, and before we do return value here, so you've got the collection, and I'm doing the serializer and reading the object. Before I return the collection, let's highlight that to make sure that I'm not pulling a fast one on you. And so there, in fact, it, it did it. And so, and I could, have, uh, I could have closed the app. I could have shut down the phone. I could reboot the phone, and this data is serialized. And so the next time you want to use it, you don't have to call the web service. It's right there local in your local storage. And so you could have all those database tables you sync down and open them locally and start working on them right away. And so uh, we'll break out of this, and we're good. And so, uh, so anyway, that's the gist of downloading products. We'll, we'll, I'll do customers. We'll just blow through it. And then upload orders. Let's show about how to, this is how you would be in the field capturing new data to send back to the office. So this is the opposite of using pencil and paper and then transcribing it later using something I call human ETL. All right, same kind of looking code here. I'm going to create an order object similar to the order object, exactly like the order object you saw on the server. Order ID, you know, how do you define what the order is, right? The ID is one, the customer, it, this, I chose one of the customers, I'm just arbitrarily putting in their ID values and product ID. And then I'm going to add that to an orders list. So let's verify that. So let's look in our list. We just have one order, and there it is. And that's what we're going to send. So we need to see that on the server side. And then this code, and again, the key takeaway here is this is boilerplate code that I'm going to give you, and you're just going to reuse it over and over again. You don't even have to know how or why. It's just going to work. And so we do the response, and then back, look, we're now back on the server. Let's highlight, because we post, here's what I passed in. Let's highlight value and look at the tool tips. Yes, there's our order ID, customer ID, so that, in fact, made it. And then I'm just doing a simple insert <coughs> on SQL Server. Hit execute query. If everything works, you know, we're good. And then we check to make sure that it was a success on the response, and it was. And we're done. Now let's quickly run, because we got we're the show me state here, aren't we? So we gotta we gotta prove that all this is actually working. So let me go to the order shard and see if it's still there. It might have already moved up. There it is. So on the order shard, it's out at that tier. So this could be one of your zillions of servers out there because you've been so successful. And then is replication working? Is it gonna upload that to the top level orders table? Let's take a look at that. And it hasn't done it yet. That's fine. It, usually it's like a one minute lag. It doesn't want to do it perpetually. And so I can either sit here and keep hitting execute, execute. Ex there it is. So it made it. So now let's quickly go and prove to you that this also works exactly the same with the tablet. Because I want you to be tablet developers too. I hear tablets are a big thing. I don't know. So I'll go ahead and shut down the phone from running. And let's go to the tablet project. And I'm not going to bore you to tears here, because wow, the code's exactly the same. So let's run the tab tablet simulator for your Windows Store app. Download products, yada, yada, yeah, looks pretty much the same. Yeah, it's calling the web server side. So that's working. This is all real. This is really real. All right, success code, good. Serializing the data using the exact same thing. All this code works. Products are offline. There's your count. There they are. So this is all good. Now we need to grab our customers, because we need our, obviously, both of those together to get those primary keys in order to create an order. Let's create an order just like we did on the phone. This time we're going to use different IDs for those, but you'll use something real in the real world, or you might use GUIDs. And then now we just jumped over to the other instance of Visual Studio. We're going to do the insert there. We got back here. Test order. We have a success. So that's done. Let's quickly take a look at the shard, sharded order table. Where is that? Is it this one? All right. Now you saw the previous order now has already been taken away. Because remember I told you that one equals zero filter to make things just upload? So now you're just seeing the most recent one. And pretty soon it'll disappear. Uh, off your shard, so you're going to keep the number of amount of data in that really low, which is going to be great because you want that for performance. 
and then the top level orders table will execute that and then, you know in a second here it's going to show up so let me shut down the tablet and we're almost done because we're basically doing a big round trip here so as you might imagine part of the value okay there's our other orders so now our other orders are come in and so what's the last part because this is a true meep solution because we're not just all Microsoft people, we have to talk to different backends, so we need to make sure that we can get it to the backend data. So now we go back to our visual drag and drop. Here's our order data flow task. I'm gonna run this. I get my green checkbox that makes me feel really good. And then let's go to my access mainframe, and I'm just gonna hit this, and there are my two orders. And so we made it all the way to the backend system. This is a pretty crazy demo. There's a lot of moving parts there. Um, and, uh, but it's important to illustrate every step of the deal to make this meet thing real for you. And also so you can see that, that you can use just the Microsoft technology you already have in your enterprise to make this happen. And so here's where we are at the end. So I showed it to you in text and talking. I showed you this in code. And then here's the picture that you can show your boss or your customer or your CIO. Check it out. This is pretty awesome. Um, I remember when I first built this, I just only had this picture. And luckily, some smart person I work with said, you know, you might want to just gradually build that together. This might be a little crazy all at once. Um, but yeah, so that's what you end up with. You know, and of course, then you could build, obviously, this is still logical. You could then build your physical architecture diagrams of that. All right, I'm going to leave it there. I see the picture. Camera's going up. That's cool. That's all good. So, uh, so that's it, actually. This is it. We built it. We walked through it. We made it real. Oh, I see a camera. Go ahead. <laughs> and yes, don't worry. The, the video is going to be on channel nine. The slides are going to be out there. I'm going to get you the code. I'm going to keep blogging. I've, so I, I've blogged about this process deep, deeply in great detail, uh, the, the whole Meep thing generically where you can just have that business conversation. I've blogged about the back-end systems to the middle tier. I've blogged about how to actually step through building that shard scale-out thing in case you need it. And I'm at the point now where I'll, I'll build out the rest of it. So hopefully the takeaway is you learned all this fun stuff. You saw it. You heard it. Uh, and so you've got the blueprint. You have the building blocks, hopefully, in your enterprise already. Um, and again, you know, I. I talk to customers all the time, and they want this thing. They need to, they, this is the use case. They, they go, you know, don't, so some, at some level, they're like, don't bore me with all these details. I just need to get data from all these back-end systems out to my devices so I can empower my field. Just, can you do that for me? And all kinds of people, we're all out here to make money, and there's all kinds of vendors and more power to everybody. Uh, and so, but all I'm trying to say is that you might find out that you already own the stuff you need to build it rather than having to build by a proprietary solution potentially. So now I think the most important thing is we, the phone, right? It's like, finally, he's done. I want to get my phone. So um, did all the, we need to collect, or have we, have we collected all the surveys or need to collect them? Okay, that's cool. So someone's going to start rapidly collecting them. Or bring him, or just, I can't yes, yeah, pass him down that. Or it could be like a Who concert where everybody tramples, you know. And then let me ask one question. If anybody's interested in a tablet book, let me think. You have to, you have to raise your hand. What's the question? Um, gosh. All right. What's the equivalent to a generic list? I'm pulling back generic lists, but if I wanted to do some data binding and have those lists turn into something different, like on Windows Phone where I'm doing data binding and it has events that fire, what would that be? I'll raise your hand. Don't blurt it out. Observable collection. You get the book. Excellent. All right. In a few seconds here, everybody will have their stuff in. I want to make sure you all get your survey in so that you actually Get, get, your, get your chance at the phone. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I have a Nokia Lumia 920 here. Yeah, just a sec. Yeah. 
All right, are we close? I think we're close. We think we're close. All right. I remember when we did this the first session on Monday, and I felt like we were really beta testing this. And you know what? It feels like we're still beta testing it. That's my fault. <laughs> All right, let me. Last call. Last call. Here we go. Got everybody? All right, that's everybody. Okay. Unless you yell at me really. Well. All right. <laughs> Do some really awesome shuffling. Drop them all in the f yeah, really throw them up in the air. Yeah. All right. I'm not looking. And the phone goes to. Is it Care? Carrie? K A R E? Excellent. Congratulations, you got a Lumia 920. All right, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate you taking the time out to spend time with me. This is great stuff.